today is about wonder. And I've had quite a bit of time to, to think about this. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a massive topic. And it's something that I think um, no one individual can tackle in its, in its entirety because everybody wonders. So, so how do you qualify that? How, how do you actually kind of like try to figure out what your opportunity is in that? So, I mean, we can break it down as a verb, so to think or to speculate curiously, or a noun, to emo uh, emotion elevated by what's unfamiliar uh, and surprising, and a feeling of puzzled interest. Um, what I like to think of it is, as is a feeling of awakening to the sheer magnificence and scale of the world around us. And so, for me, um, not many people know this, uh, but I'm adopted. And my life started out um, in, in the care of somebody else for the first three months. And then I had this, these wonderful people that adopted me. But I'd always had this question. I'd always wondered about my, my, my birth mom. Didn't really think about my birth father at all, but I had conjured this vision of my birth mom for, for years and right from day one. And so my, my dad, um, this is my, my adoptive, adoptive dad, knew that I was kind of a kid that was absent-minded, kind of lived in, in my imagination and things like that. And he kind of knew that I was trying to tackle some pretty big things in my life. And so um, he would take me out um, to look at the stars at night. He would try and um, expose me to the, the world around me that wasn't you know, under my mom's uh, apron and things like that. And my parents both really tried to push me to, to really kind of um, figure out what this, this whole thing was. And so um, one of my favorite movies is The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. And what, what's really interesting about this film is that the character and I both share um, the same um, Myers-Briggs personality type, which is <laughs> INFP. And so for me, um, you know, these are some of the things that kind of make me tick. You know, I have a strong sense of curiosity. I always have. I've always wondered how the world works. Um, I step out of, outside of myself often and look back much like Walter Mitty. Like I can sort of depart from the world and kind of retreat to my own space and it, it's a very safe place for me and it takes me into some weird places in my mind. But you know, I'm also, as a designer and as a creative, I'm a natural problem solver. And so that, the ability to imagine, the, the ability to separate myself from the world, the, the ability to actually solve problems is great. And as I get older, I'm 56 now, um, I, I present challenges to me uh, in the creative space that you'll see th this morning uh, that really kind of pushed me uh, outside of myself. Um, so the, basically, as a designer, as an artist, we all love change in some form, okay? And I think that's really important that as we, be, as we are wanderers naturally as human beings, that ability to really kind of embrace change and really go about your life experimenting and trying new things increases the sense of wonder that you have. Um, I have a, a balance in my life. I've carved out a significant time for the projects that I'm going to show you. Um, and I am absent-minded. I'm less organized, and those of you who have worked with me understand that. Um, but I'm a big picture guy, and, and I, I love to go uh, to those spaces. So most of all, and this is kind of a weird thing about me, I, I enjoy sitting on my own for long periods, periods of time just thinking. Not with a phone, not with a computer, not with anything, but just contemplating life and the questions that I have about it. So um, I, have, I, I had a, a great instructor in, in, uh, in, in, uh, at ACAD, and he said to me one day, I'm paraphrasing here, but Scott, fill your life with everything, listen to all genres and forms of music, look in, at and appreciate uh, art in all of its forms, uh, experience theater and opera, read the newspaper every morning, be current with the state of the world, listen to the many perspectives that people have, especially ones you disagree with, share your ideas, and learn to love change. And that was in probably second year of, uh, of design school. And this, this stuck with me. As soon as Chuck said it, it stuck with me for my career. And so I, th this, this statement is really sort of one of the driving things about me. But it has also enabled me to kind of ponder some big questions. And the, the, one of the big ones that I've always had is the, the differ difference between desire and inti or immediacy. And desire is something that's rare these days. To long and to yearn for something without having it immediately it is a rare thing. And, and I would like to figure out how to get back to that. Um, what you'll see in my work is, is that you can, talk, you can slow time down to a crawl, okay? And, and, and spend time with it and really look at the world around you to start to understand it better. Um, and, to, and to understand that that is really a form of research that leads to more questions and more answers. Um, and, and what you'll see is it gets really personal. 
So what started, every, started it off was really this whole notion of slow TV. And uh, a, a guy named, or by the name of uh, Thomas Hellam, who has a, a great TED talk, um, was the producer behind this slow television uh, movement in Norway. And so what, what's really interesting about this, and hopefully this works, oop, no, it's not going to work. But um, what, what's really interesting is that they have a series of seven to, to 10 hour uh, 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 videos of just cameras strapped to the front of a train or on the front of a, of a, a Norsk uh, cargo ship. And you sit there and you watch it for seven to, to, to nine hours. It became a sensation in Norway of just sitting there and watching the train go through the landscape for seven hours. And so that kind of got me thinking about time and its relationship to the things that I was wondering about. So the first project that I have, or that I took on, was really to find a place uh, in the Kananaskis, in this case, it's Rumble 4 Bay, just above uh, Canmore, and spend a time, like six years and 42 mornings, photographing the same scene uh, and trying to figure out what was actually changing in the landscape and so on. So it brings, from a design standpoint and from a thinking standpoint, it brings in all kinds of different uh, factors. And so th this, is really, this is really just a, a series of some of the images. Sorry for the quality from the projector. The, the, the highlights are quite blown out. Um, but really, sitting up there on the edge of this, this pond um, that's really a man-made uh, reservoir, and really kind of looking at the landscape around me from winter to summer, looking at um, a fall sunrise, looking at a, a cold day, minus 20, in the middle of winter, looking at a smoky day in, or a smoky morning in summer, all of these things start to reveal a landscape to me that I, that I start to understand and, and my sense of wonder actually increases because of all the time that I'm spending there. I'm, I'm always conscious of getting jumped by a cougar from behind me because I'm sitting there <laughs> taking this all in, but it's never happened, touch wood. Um, and, and so it's, uh, you know, who would think that just a contrail would actually create a nice um, framing feature for, for, for a scene? And so, so the more time that I spent with this, the uh, the, uh, the, the more that, that sort of nature came out to me and kind of revealed uh, what it was about and, and to really kind of give me a sense of really kind of how weather patterns happened and how clouds happened and the fact that you can't just expect to get the best photo the first time that you, you go out. And in fact, you can take a thousand photos and probably not get the quintessential uh, photo that, that should be taken of that experience. And so, um, so, so for me, that this is something that, that it is ongoing, but I've moved on to, to other things. But they, it did reveal to me um, everything from the, the grandness of, of that actual landscape to all the stuff that goes through the water. You know, it, it, it's kind of mundane, but tree branches. But if you look at the way the tree branches, uh, tree branch frames with uh, the sky and, and things like that, it was really kind of interesting to me. Or how the water level changes and, and rocks and, and different features come out of, out of the pond. Um, how wildlife uh, uh, engages that, uh, that space and so on. Uh, but what was probably most striking to me was this little row of trees, and I think what I liked about the space was it's got a very thin horizon line, and it's great for reflections and really get, giving you a sense of, of grandness and really kind of how that changes over time, uh, depending on if it's a foggy morning uh, or so on. And really, in the end, just w within the details of that, that landscape, um, how am I actually building a sense of really what that space is about? The second project is uh, another Kananaskis project. Again, it's another slow project. Uh, eight years, 44 snowshoes, uh, up to Rawson Lake, Chester Lake, um, uh, uh, Rummel Lake, um, and, and places like that, to really start to understand snow and what was, what, how snow was impacting the environment. And from year to year, what was happening with the, with the landscape? And so what started me off on this one was Margaret Atwood, who has this quote, says the Eskimos had 52 names for so snow because it was important to them. There ought to be as many for love. And so I started to do some research on, on uh, um, various uh, in Inuit languages to, see, see, to try and prove out, are there 52 or are there 1,000 words for snow? And all of a sudden, I find these languages. And for what we call snow here, or slush, or, or, or whatever, whatever you want to call it, they go into detail about snow and all of its conditions. And so I, I was captivated by this and I thought, I wonder, I wonder what that's about and I wonder what I can do by just heading out into nature and starting to understand that. And so in Kananaskis, um, this is up at Rawson Lake, this is below the Rawson Headwall, 
um, I started to look at it. And my, my first interest was really in composition, shadow, uh, the way light was, was uh, cast and things, or shadows were cast and light, things like that. But then I started to notice within the landscape that there's these little trees, and it, it, you can't really see it here. But on this avalanche slope, this, this thing that gets pounded every year by avalanches, there are these single trees in the Kananaskis. And this is really something that really kind of fascinated me. And over the years, depending on the snowpack, this single tree on this avalanche slope reveals itself. And, and so from a kilometer away, this is with a long lens, you can pretty much tell the difference in the snowpack from year to year. But for some reason, this tree persists. And then I found this other one right here in the middle. OK? And it's on this real, it's on this vertical slope. And it gets, you can tell it gets pounded by avalanches every year. Um, and you look at it the next year, here it is over on the sort of two thirds uh, right. Um, light's different, time of day is different. Um, this is, this is uh, something that, that was really kind of interesting to me. And so, um, so what, what's really interesting, I think, well, here's one more. Um, little tree with these snow rollers. Um, next year, trees more revealed. Um, and so I got, this, I got this thing for these single trees of the Kananaskis. And so, I, but I think what's, what's really interesting to me is that all of this revealed that in April, if you go in early April, between sort of like April 2nd to April 15th on a sunny day, the sun comes over the south call of Rawson Lake just enough, or actually comes up over um, the, the call um, to, to basically uh, put light or, or really broad or bold sunlight onto, uh, onto the, the, uh, the, the rock face. And you can sit there in a little snow bank, or in a snow bank, and sit there for probably an hour and a half and watch avalanches from a kilometer away. And you just go up there, you park yourself in a snow bank, and, and you just hear the roar. And it's quite an amazing thing. But you wouldn't really know that unless you spent a lot of time with that space. And so you know, I'm fascinated by the forms, the snow rollers, but also the, the various forms that are happening of, of, of fresh snow on, on, on river rocks, and really how ice and, and river flows kind of affect things. But also to be there for these massive avalanches that, that, that happen. And they, they can be like 30 times a day if you go up within that two or three week period on a sunny day. Um, so the, the other thing, too, that I started to notice was that human forms started to appear out of the snow. So a baby nursing um, and, and things like that. And I'm starting to see things uh, within the landscape that become very detail-oriented and become very uh, specific. But again, the thing that really kind of um, uh, was great for me was just to, to park myself in the snowbank and, and enjoy this free show that happens every year. But it is really kind of becomes really kind of a spiritual thing for me, um, in that you know I can't really comprehend everything that's happening, but but I'm, I'm feeling it, and, and there's a sense of, of of place there that is deeply personal to me. So if you want to uh, check out this work, it's divided into a number of different galleries. Um, I've got a site at blackfrost.ca uh, that talks about the region and and and, and why um, I, I, why I did this. <coughs> The, uh, the next one is, is really a current project. So I just got back from, from Newfoundland uh, last week. And this one was really about, um, well, how do we actually take a, a place that's far away, Newfoundland? It's a, um, not an easy place to get to necessarily. Uh, not a lot of people go there. Um, but how, do I, how, again, do I actually take one location and start to really discover what that was about, as opposed to just you know, visiting small towns and talking with people and things like that? Is there something about photography and the, the spaces created between photos that give, would give others a sense of really what this, um, what this place was about and to help them wonder really why they might actually go and, and visit a place like that? And so um, what I did was I went to a number of communities uh, that, were, that were resettled uh, back in the 60s. Uh, a lot of small fishing villages were um, were abandoned and the residents moved to, to larger centers and there's a number of these um, number of these villages that you can get to by boat um, but to really kind of look at, at, uh, at what's going on there and to start to develop a narrative of, of human interaction and really nature's impact on, on human uh, 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 presence and things like that um, but also to look at um, to visit and revisit places where time is, is changing um, uh, uh, everything. Okay, so you just take binoculars and really kind of look how, you know, three years ago 
Uh, these binoculars were starting to deteriorate and, and just two weeks or just a week ago, um, uh, what, what's happened there. So I'm looking at the, at the world around me in very, very specific ways, but also developing a narrative. I was out there again like uh, three years ago and the pack ice was in and it was an amazing iceberg year, but what's the relationship of, of the people that live uh, in that area with nature um, and the relationship of the window to the puffin and, and really what, the, what might that do uh, to, to build a sense of, of really what the space is between these two photographs. Um, to really look at features of the landscape and, and icebergs and rock and, and things like that, and really kind of look at um, the different qualities of sky and sea and things like that and, and, and nature and balance. Um, to look at various forms in a landscape and relate them to things that I'm, that I'm experiencing, to really start to build a sense of really kind of what, what that space is actually about. Um, and so, so, like I said, I'm four years into it, but really trying to look really hard at the, at the place that I'm at to, to try and, uh, at this point, um, look at the thousands of photographs that I have and to start to look at, well, what's the commonality with what I'm actually seeing and, 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 and expressing and, and how might that actually uh, influence the, the way that people actually feel about the space? How do we take something that's, that's ancient and old, um, like a root cellar, and look at the immediacy of, of man and, and nature reclaiming space um, within a small town. Um, and how does long time uh, affect or uh, uh, relate to, to short time? Um, how do we look at uh, the human life cycle and how do we look at um, the, the deterioration of nature or, or erosion uh, and natural processes? And how do we actually look at the landscape and look at um, a rough sea and what snow does to to long grass over time and the sea forms that, that kind of come out of that. Um, but also, these are kind of luck shots, but um, finding things that really have a common kind of, um, common kind of story, materiality, those types of, types of things um, that may have very similar kind of um, compositions um, and things like that. Um, the, uh, and again, this is the final one, sorry, the, the, the highlights are blown out. But again, it's, this is one of my favorite ones. So, you know, a 200 foot uh, tall iceberg uh, off of a cliff and, and uh, this hokey old t town in, or a sign in the town of Bonavista and the relationship of really kind of ice to, to human presence and, and development. So the last one that I want to share with you is, is a book that I'm currently working on where, you know, I, I live in a world of wonder and every day you, I will depart to some space in my head and just kind of uh, daydream uh, and imagine things, but, but I think there's, there, in, intention has, there's a great opportunity with intention to help others kind of consider the world around them, not necessarily the way that I'm doing it, but to, to challenge them with, with some ideas uh, that they might want to explore. And so what I'm working on is called the Book of Moments. And the Book of Moments, it, it, the, the subtitle here is, or how to put into, or how to put more into life by considering and capturing moment, moments uh, that make it more meaningful and memorable. Um, this is really a bit of a workbook of 100 sayings uh, about moments. A moment's notice, a moment of realization, and so on. And going, a moment is a very specific thing and it means something different to everybody. But moments have, happen every day and every second. Um, and how do we actually consciously start to think about that in a way that actually improves our life or helps us better understand uh, our world or the relationships that we have with others. And does, does a moment need to be a uh, 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 like, a, like a big thing? Or can it actually be quite fleeting and, and, and temporary? And so that the, the book that, that I'm uh, uh, work, working on is really a bit of a workbook. So this is just an example. So a moment of realization, the light bulb goes on, and in a flash, a chain reaction happens, and the synapses fire. It comes from in the form of, a, of an aha, a quickening of the heart rate, and of one plus one equals, equals three. Get out of your car and walk a route you would normally drive. Uh, it can be a few blocks or a neighborhood. Discover what happens when you slow things down and take in the details. Capture that experience in a series of five photos to tell a story. What did you learn? How, uh, what, what do you realize that you didn't before? And so it's not a self-help book. It's really a bit of a manual for being more aware of your life and the things that are going on in it. And to, to challenge yourself to really kind of bring those up in, in your mind a little bit and realize that, that uh, 
any moment can be significant. It doesn't have to be monumental. It's just something you need to kind of consider that there is meaning and moments do impact you, they impact, impact other people. Um, so how do you actually up-level those, up those a little bit? Um, and really for me, it's really about, um, a, it is about wonder. It, 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 it's, it's about how am I continuing to, to think and look at the world around me and how am I pursuing and hopefully coming up with new questions that I don't yet know or understand that are gonna push me onto a new project where I'm considering the world around me in a different way. So that's, that's really kind of what I'm about. I, I've, never, I've never sold a photo, that's not the intention. I, I rarely show people this stuff because it's for me personally. Um, there's, there's really no commerce portion to this, maybe except for the book, but I, I think for me, it gives me a sense of me. It gives me a sense of when I'm, uh, with all the craziness that goes on in my career uh, at AU Arts or, or in, my, in my private practice, this is something that I claim for me that I, I reflect on. I go back and I look at this body of the work and it's about memory, it is about wonder, but it, it's also about telling me that it's okay to, to really slow things down and to really consider the world around me and to spend a significant time doing it. So, so for me, I'm lucky. I have a, a partner, Sue. Uh, we've been together for 33 years. Never, have, never had kids, have five cats. <laughs> Life is pretty simple, right, um, at that point. Uh, I've got aging parents, which, is, which everybody has. But you know, it does enable me um, to really sort of make sure that my weekends do give me that time to reflect and to generate uh, the thinking that I need to. So really, that's all I wanted to share with you today, was just really you know, a different way of thinking about time. And, it's, and, and really, I can't, what I would say is less about go, 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 and, and, and where do you actually take the opportunity for yourself to slow it down and to give, you, give yourself that time to really kind of consider uh, what's going on around you. So thank you. <laughs>